In this video, we're going to be covering subdivision surfaces. And subdivision surfaces all start with faceted models, which are also sometimes referred to as poly models, which doesn't mean that the polys themselves need to be flat per se, but they do need to be faceted in nature. And we're going to start off with a very basic polygon, which is just a flat four-sided surface. And in subdivision surface modeling, this would be considered what's called a quad. Quads are four-sided polygons. And as a rule of thumb, those are the best types of polygons that you want to use when you're working with subdivision surface modeling. Now, in order to convert a polygon into a subdivision surface, we're going to use the seventh row icon in the first column of the tool palette, which is the subdivision tools. And then secondarily, in the second column, seventh row, there are the subdivision edit tools, which we will be exploring as well. So we're going to choose the subdivision tool, and you'll notice that's called sub D. And sub D is an abbreviation that is commonly used when referring to subdivision surface modeling, or SDS. So interchangeably, you might hear all three of those, sub Ds, SDS, and subdivision surfaces. So clicking on that tool and then clicking on our polygon gives us this circular shape. And you can see that the edges of that polygon now are the controls of the subdivision surface. So when we hover over each edge, it highlights in red. If we hover over a point, it highlights in red. If we hover over the entire face, it highlights in red. So if we click and drag on one of those sub elements, it will begin to manipulate the shape of the underlying surface as if this were a cage that are controlling the boundaries of that. And clicking on the entire face will move the entire thing around. Clicking on an edge will move an edge. And clicking on a point will move one point at a time. Now you can shift click on multiple objects and then you can drag them as well. So there's a lot of underlying things going on here with this cage and you'll want to get familiar with those so that you get the results that you expect when you start clicking and dragging on those. Now you don't have to simply use the click and drag technique. You can also use the move command, for example. So if I click on the move transform, I can click on a segment and drag that segment. I can click on a point and drag that point. I can click on a face and move the entire thing. The other transform tools work as well. So if I were to look at the rotate command, for example, I can click on an edge and I can rotate it. And you'll notice that it modifies the underlying sub D geometry as expected. So you don't have to move these orthogonally. You can move them very freely and get very organic shapes, which is the whole idea behind subdivision surfaces. Now you can also move in the vertical orientation. So again, clicking and starting a move transform and tapping on the command key on the Mac or control on Windows. We can now move points or edges or faces in any direction that we want as well. Doesn't have to be just along the reference plane. So you can see by doing this, we start to add some more complexity to the underlying surface. Now, when a control cage is visible like this, we can right click on it and access more commands. We can select sequences, we can insert sequences, and we also have the ability to delete or remove different subcomponents. What I'm going to do first is insert a sequence. And just going by the name subdivision surfaces, we're going to actually subdivide the surface. And whenever you subdivide the surface, you're basically adding more detail and more control to how that surface can actually be sculpted. So I'm going to right click right around the midpoint of this segment, and I'm going to choose to insert a sequence. And you'll see a new cage element get drawn in here bisecting this cage in this direction. So anywhere you insert a new sequence, it's going to go perpendicular to the edge that you're right clicking on. I'm going to insert that and you'll see it draws it right from midpoint to midpoint roughly. Again, this is all going by eye right now. I'm not snapping to any grids and there are no snaps on control cages. So something to keep in mind is that this is very free form modeling. So I'm also going to go over on this segment and I'm going to right click towards the end of this segment and we're going to get a bisecting sequence that's going to go across here. And the reason it's called a sequence is because it is going to go completely from one side of the cage to the other. It will not stop at this bisection that we put in the middle. So right clicking here, inserting a sequence, you'll see it goes across the entire cage. And when it does that, we can start to see the ISO lines that are lying underneath here. And we can see where that rounding is starting and ending. And that is actually what these cages are controlling. 
that type of behavior. So if I were to add another one in here as well, you'll see that that rounding gets even tighter. So by subdividing this surface, we are getting more and more detail, more and more control so that we can manipulate the underlying geometry with this control cage. Now that we've done that, we can start to do other things. So now I'm going to right click and I'm going to select a sequence and you'll notice that it now selects the sequence of edges all the way across the cage. And now I can click and drag on that and I happen to have my perpendicular snap still on. So you can see I can now arch this and flex it. And this is a really wonderful way to start to sculpt our geometry. I think this is a good place to pause and go back and look at our underlying cage geometry because subdivision surface tools allow us to manipulate this geometry either in its original polygon form or in its subdivided form. But in order to do that, we need to get rid of these controls because you'll notice when I hover over this, I'm rarely ever selecting the object itself. I'm actually selecting different parts of the control cage. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to right click on the object and turn off show controls so we can now see the underlying subdivision surface. And now I'm gonna click on the swap tool and click on my object and you'll see it takes us back to that original polygon form with those new subdivisions included in them. Now the interesting thing about this is you can continue to sculpt this here in polygon form as well. So if I were to go back to the pick tool and maybe change this to edges and grab an edge and then move that edge and see I move it up and it starts to break these different polygons here. If I swap this now back to my subdivision surface, you'll notice that the sub D is also updated. So now this object is kind of two objects at the same time. It's an underlying cage type of an object and it's also a subdivision surface and I can freely swap between those depending on the tools that I wanna to use to sculpt that. Just remember that the cage is also the controls of the subdivision surface. So again, I'm going to turn off controls for this object and we're going to look at this in wireframe view and we're gonna see how many polygons are actually making up this surface. So in wireframe, it's very easy to see that there are a lot of polygons making up for the smoothness of this overall subdivision surface. And again, if I right click on that and I go into the parameters of that, we'll see that there are a number of iterations and a sharpness control for every subdivision surface. So I could lower the number of iterations down to something like three and hit okay, and we'll see that the number of polygons was reduced pretty substantially. So you can change the number for the iterations at any time and raise and lower the underlying polygons of that subdivision surface. If performance becomes a factor when you have a lot of sub Ds in your scene and they have a very high number in the iterations, that would be something to look at to lower that down to increase display performance. And you could raise it back up before rendering or if you wanted to convert it as a very high resolution NURBS sheet, for example, as a very last step. Now you can select your object. You could go into the inspector and you could have this parameters tab on the screen at all times. And you'll notice now that the iterations is set to three. And we also have a sharpness, which we're gonna talk about here shortly. You can manipulate the geometry of the sub D itself without the control cage being visible. How you would do that is just go to your pick tool, choose segments, for example. You notice I can click on a segment. I can click on the move tool and I can move that segment. And you'll notice that the sub D is being modified in real time as well. So you don't have to explicitly manipulate the cage. You can manipulate the sub elements of the sub D surface itself. So if I wanted to go to faces, for example, I can click on the face, select it, and then click on the move tool and then begin to move that face. And you can see where the face was now to a new location, clicking on that and moving it will update its location. One thing that I like to do is actually use the transform tool to do a lot of this because this is such a visual sculpting exercise with sub Ds. And under the transform tool palette, we have a transform tool inside of there. And what I like to do is set a shortcut for that so that it's very easy to access. And you can see that I have set the letter T as the keystroke shortcut for that. So now if I were simply to select a face or a series of faces, let's go ahead and hold down the shift key and select three different faces tap the T key, and now I have a transform controller here where I can now manipulate that very visually 
in any direction that I want without having to click multiple times on the grid to control where those are moving. I also have access to rotation, for example. And again, this becomes a very freeform way to manipulate our geometry visually. The cool thing about that is I can hold down my command key and I can hover over different sub elements like this one, for instance, with the transform tool active. I can manipulate that. I can click off of it, go to another one, and I don't have to continually select a new element, click off of it, select a transform tool. It just becomes very free flow editing. And I really appreciate this tool for that. Okay, now back to sharpness. So once again, I'm going to select my object with the auto pick tool. I'm going to show controls for that, which you can access in the inspector palette, or you can right click and show controls on it. And let's take a look at what sharpness is. So if you have the whole element selected and I increase sharpness, you'll notice that the sub D surface is pushed more towards the cage in a less relaxed fashion. And if I go all the way down to zero, it is the most relaxed that that surface can be inside of the cage. Now, one of the neat things about this is you can actually apply this to sub elements. You don't have to apply it to the whole thing. In order to do that, we're actually going to click on the sub D tool one more time, and we're going to click on our object and we're going to look at it in the tool options. So again, sharpness can be applied to the entire object, but I can also select a couple of edges, like let's select this edge and hold down the shift key and select this edge and just increase the sharpness for those, for example. So I can pull that up to maybe 30 something percent. And I can also select it for corner points as well. You can do faces, edges, or points. So if I select this corner point, let's say this corner point and this corner point, and let's increase the sharpness at those to really pull it into those exactly into the corner. Now I'm gonna right click and turn off my controls. And we can see that that surface now goes sharply into those corners. So you can do it this way, although I would have to say it is not recommended to use the sharpness control that often. It's actually much better just to increase the number of edges to control that sharpness rather than doing this because there's no indicator of where sharpness has been applied and it could throw you for a loop when you go to edit your geometry later. So I'm gonna undo that back to where it just was. So if I just wanted to create more sharpness up here, like I did in the first part of that example, I might just right click towards the end of this segment and insert a sequence here. And you can see that it starts to pull that corner more sharply into the corner of the cage. And that's the technique that is recommended for this kind of manipulation, because then you never have to remember where sharpness has been applied. Now, if you absolutely must have sharpness, you must have sharpness and it's okay to use that. It's just something you want to be mindful about because it's hard to remember sometimes where you've applied it. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like to get notified when new videos are released on this channel, click the subscribe button below and click the notification bell icon to get a notification when new videos are released. See you in the next one.